Good morning. Good morning, brothers and sisters. I've got a message for you today. This is Marcus, and I've got a message for you today that you are absolutely not going to believe. This is not one of those messages where I, I came up with a title, and I said, well, this would be a good thing to talk about today. This message literally... The Holy Spirit worked through me while I was uh, putting this thing together. And you're going to hear a message today that is so good. I'm not trying to be prideful, but so good that you're not going to believe a word I say. And since you're not going to believe a word I say, that's going to make you or cause you to open up your Bible and actually check everything that I tell you today. You're going to hear stuff you never heard before. This is an action-packed, filled with application. This is all about equipping the saints. And i got to get into this. This is really good stuff. Today's message is about building relationships and lay counseling. Counseling as a lay ministry. One of the problems today in the church, we are the church. The church is largely driven by the professionals, your preachers, your elders, deacons. This, this is driving the church. These are the workers in the church. Literally, they seem to do almost everything. And, you know, the problem is we see that every, all the programs and everything else in the church, mostly, to the greatest extent, is accomplished and driven by those professionals, the people with titles. You know those name tag people in the church, right? The laity, the laity, the lay people, the laity feels, you know, we feel nowadays in the church that we built for ourselves, we feel that like going to church services... You know, giving offerings and watching the good old show. That's the job of the average Christian. You know, literally, if you ask someone, if you're out there witnessing, and depending on how you do it, but you, you ask someone if they're a believer or if they're a Christian, what do they say? They never really answer your question, right? You say, are you a Christian? What will they tell you? They'll usually say, well, yeah, I go to this church over here. I, I go to this First Baptist, I go to this uh, Assembly of God, I, I go to this Methodist, because that's what we have decided is, uh, you know, being a Christian nowadays. So, from the very beginning, our Lord taught that our relationship with Him should affect our relationship with others, right? You are to love one another as I have loved you. This is John chapter 13, verse 34 to 35. The Apostle Paul also instructs us, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. See, we can see a definite connection. When Jesus prayed, he prayed to the Father. He prayed for a long time. And what was he asking, really, for us to be connected to him? Like, he is connected to the Father. Therefore, we should be connected connected to the bride, the body of Christ, as he is connected to us, right? So we see the, the connection here. He interacted with the Father, and he, he inter, uh, Jesus interacted with the Father. But that same connection continues on in how we are to inter, interact with fellow Christians. So we see how the early church, you'll see, we kind of build our own church the way we want right now. There's nothing wrong with it. We, this is how we come together and we are a family, right? But we see how the early church, how they literally placed a premium on their family, their body of Christ, their local body of Christ, our church, our local body of Christ. They placed a premium on that group. We've seen how they came together and they stayed together. They lived life together. They built community together. And they literally sold everything they had. And they brought it into a, the commune. And it was a, their own society. It was a true family. Much greater than our nuclear family today. 
it was the family, the body, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ. The reason I'm wearing this today, I'm trying to see if this mic is better than that mic so you can actually hear me uh, more clearly. I need all the help I can get. I've got that, uh, I, I don't have an accent uh, to say because I've lived so many places, but I definitely got a mumble. And uh, so, anyway, I need all the help I can get. In our love for each other, in our love for each other, it shouldn't be a surprise that we should offer care for each other. Now, we see the, the professionals, the pastors, right? The elders, most of the pastors, they're out there with pastoral care. They're offering uh, counseling, uh, bereavement counseling, grief counseling, uh, visitation. They're, they're the foot soldiers in the body of Christ, kind of backwards, kind of backwards. Should they be doing this? Yes, but not, they shouldn't be the ones mostly doing this. I'm going to prove this to Scripture. The stuff I'm telling you today, I don't expect you to believe me, okay? Hey, you pull out your Bibles and check and, and find out if I'm making this stuff up, okay? Find out if I'm telling the truth, because you're going to need to, because some of this stuff is not going to be believable to most of us. We see our elders. They're demonstrating pastoral care, right? We feel like it is the job that only they can do. The elders, your pastors, your deacons, your, these kind of people. But we couldn't be more wrong about this. We couldn't be more wrong. Just because, you see, just because some are called to full-time ministry doesn't mean that you're not just as much a minister as they are. Just because a, a Christian is called to be a full-time pastor doesn't mean you don't preach. Just because a person is called to be a full-time counselor, it doesn't mean that you don't counsel. You see, you'll see today, you are every bit of minister as they are. And when you see what their job is, this will come into perspective to you. You'll see that, yeah, that, that is true. They are there so we can be almost more like them. Hmm, that's weird. We can be more wrong about how we actually look at this. Some are called a full-time ministry, but you're also a minister just like they are. So here's what I'm saying. The greatest confusion that causes the disconnect in how we view the differences among each of us is how we define laity or lay people. We have somehow diluted this title. We have somehow diluted laity throughout the years. You see what I'm saying? What is laity? Well, if you're like me, up until recently, us, the, the church, right? We're laity, right? We're the, we're the, uh, we're the uh, bench warmers, right? We're out there, we're enjoying the show. But we're not the, the workers, the church workers. Uh, or maybe we're the church workers, but we're not the one uh, doing the ministry, right? That's for the professionals. These people that, that went to school or they, you know, all these other things. Now listen, I'm going to use a, I hate to use a lot of any message I got but uh, from one a resource, but... I kind of have to. I'd like for you to look at this. Healing Relationships, a Christian's Manual for Lay Counseling. And I, the reason I have this book in my hand is because I'm using it for a lot of the, the uh, one of the chaplain courses I'm doing outside of school. Stephen Grunland and Daniel Lembrides. Lembrides, I, I don't know what his name is. It really doesn't even matter. But here it is. Look, see? I suggest everyone get one. This is really good. And it, it's packed full of action-packed stuff and application. So this book is called Healing Relationship. So we need to find out what is laity. If we're laity, what is laity? So I'm going to read an excerpt from this book. Laity in ministry. In popular usage, the term laity or lay people refers to non-professionals. You know, professional, we would usually... Uh, I call people professionals if they're paid to do something or it's their full-time occupation. That's professional, right? For example, in the field of medicine, doctors and nurses are professionals. 
while the rest of us are laypersons, right? In the field of law, lawyers are professionals, but doctors and nurses are laypersons. In the church, the clergy are considered the professionals, while the laity are the non-professionals. The bench warmers, right? Okay. However, it is important for us to understand how the Bible uses these terms. The English word laity is a transliteration of the Greek word laikos, which means belonging to the laos. The word laos is used 143 times in the New Testament and is usually translated people. So you'll see that the uh, laikos, which means belong to the laos, <laughs> and laos is translated people. It's not translated non-professionals. So you, you'll see, listen to this. It's used 143 times in the New Testament, and that's where we find the New Covenant, right? And that's what we're living under right now. It's the people. So who is the laity? I, I got news for you. I, I just read this. This is, this is everybody in the church, including the professionals. The church is laity, not bench warmers. The church. In the four Gospels, as well as the early chapters of Acts, Laos generally, generally refers to Israel or the Jewish people. That's Matthew chapter 2, verse 6, John chapter 11, verse 50. However, after the establishment of the church, in the rest of Acts and the epistles, Laos refers to the Christian community. This can be found in Acts, Romans, Titus, Hebrews, and 1 Peter. I'm not going to go through the chapters and verses. Just read it and see what I'm saying here. Acts, Romans, Titus, Hebrews, First Peter. Let's yeah, Acts chapter eighteen, verse ten, Romans chapter nine, verse twenty five, Titus chapter two, verse fourteen, Hebrews chapter four, verse nine, first Peter chapter two, verse nine. The church is the Laos or people of God. Whereas the Jews were referred to as the people of God in the Old Testament. We weren't part of that, right? The Mosaic Law. We weren't allowed to have it. We weren't introduced to it. It had nothing to do with us. But that all shifted with the Messiah. The church is seen as the people of God in the New Testament. Romans, Gal uh, Romans Galatians, and 1 Peter. Furthermore, every time the word laos is used of Christians in the New Testament, it refers to all the believers. Furthermore, every time the word laos is used of Christians in the New Testament, it refers to all the believers. It is never used to distinguish between ordinary believers and a priestly or a ministerial class. You, this is going to get deep. Make sure you're listening to this. This is good. According to the New Testament, all of us as believers make up the laos or people of God. Now, listen, we may best understand the status of as full and equal members and participants in the church and its ministry by what is commonly known as the doctrine of the priesthood of the believer. The doctrine of the priesthood of the believer. This involves every single believer. We are given a royal, a royal priesthood. Not if you're standing on a stage. Not if you're called a full time. Well, also them too, of course. Of course. But uh, every believer, we are part of the royal priesthood through Jesus Christ, right? You know the best part of me carrying on like that? <laughs> Is I always lose my place in a book. <laughs> we may best understand this as believer. This doctrine received... Okay. We may best understand the status of the laity as full and equal members of participants in the church and its ministry by what is commonly known as the doctrine of the priesthood of the believer. This doctrine received its fullest treatment through our founding father, Martin Luther, right? The doctrine received its fullest treatment through Martin Luther's study of the second chapter of 1 Peter. The major theme of 1 Peter, now read 1 Peter, okay? 
The major theme of 1 Peter deals with how to handle persecution that results from living as a Christian in a pagan world. Peter points out that Christians are in a special relationship to God. Now, we're in a special relationship to God. He, this is the words that he uses. He uses words such as an elect. In 1 Peter, read all 1 Peter. He describes us Christians as elect, as called, and chosen. All believers. Elect, called, and chosen. This election, calling, and choice is based on the atonement provided by Jesus Christ. Believers are able to handle persecution and to suffer even as Christ did. And we get that power through the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? Believers are able to handle persecution and to suffer, even as Christ did, through faith in God's plan of salvation. Because we have faith in Christ and his atonement, we know that we are God's elect, we are God's called, and we are God's chosen and have direct access to God. To God. Let's talk about direct access to God, okay? It's definitely an area we've got to cover. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 through 10 is a proclamation, proclamation of all the Christians as the Laos of God, the people of God, a holy and royal priesthood who serve God in handling persecution and suffering. According to this passage, all believers are priests before God. According to this passage, all believers are priests before God. Not bench warmers. Each of us, we have equal access to God. And there is no need for another person to mediate between us and God. Now we see some uh, faith movements out there that they'll, they'll throw in a, a human person. <laughs> and to get to God, you got to go through this, this human person. And uh, the Bible definitely does not support that. Anyway, it doesn't matter. We're not here to play religious politics commenting on the royal priesthood in chapter 2 verse 5 and verse 9 Luther says it would please me very much if the word priest were, was used as commonly as the term Christian this is the founder of our faith movement right he would he wished that the term priest would be used just as much as the word Christian because he thinks it kind of leads us in the wrong direction. Just like Martin Luther, if you remember, he wanted the entire book of James to be thrown out of the canon because the whole faith and works thing, he said James kind of made the believers think stuff that they probably shouldn't think because how he said it. So Martin Luther really wanted the whole book of James thrown out. But we kind of understand it today. We understand why he said that, which helps protect us from leading uh, down the wrong path. Now listen, he wants the word priest used just as much as the word Christian. For priests, the baptized and Christians are all one and the same. Listen, for priests, the baptized and Christians are all one and the same. So we are royal priests, right? I, I just showed you the verses. We've covered what laity is. We've covered direct access to God. Now, we've established all this. So now we've got to talk about what is the role of laity. What is the role of laity? We've established that we have the same status as anyone else that are believers, right? Right? So what is the role of laity? The holy and royal priesthood. These two roles are readily evident in the passage. In this passage, at least two roles really jump out there as the role of the laity. The first, according to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, is to offer spiritual sacrifices. This relates to worship. We are to worship. We are to lift God up. 
each of us as Christians to be involved in worship. Since we each have direct access to God, we are to use that access for worship as we bring our spiritual sacrifices. The second role, according to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, is to declare the promises of God. This is the second evident role, to declare the promises of God. Not only are we to worship God, we are also to proclaim the good news, the gospel. We are to proclaim the good news that all may become priests by faith in Christ. There it is again. We are all priests. Now, Howard Snyder has suggested a third role growing out of this passage on the priesthood, priesthood of the believer. And I, very good uh, catch here. Howard Snyder has suggested a third role growing out of the passage on the priesthood of the believer and that of being priest to each other. He points out that many persons understand the priesthood of the believer only in terms of direct access to God. You see, we, now we understand, we've seen that we have, we have inherited from Jesus a royal priesthood. So we understand that this, in fact, gives us direct access to God, right? But that's where we fall short. What, we are also priests to fellow believers. We are priests to each other. We are a fellowship. We are a community of God's people. Are supposed to be, right? Now listen, I'm just going to get a little deeper here. I hope you got your seatbelt on. If you're a Christian, you have gifts of the Spirit. You have at least one of the gifts. Gifts of the Spirit, they're, they're multiple things. You can get one or you can get more than one, right? But you probably don't get all. I mean, it's, it's different from fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit is many things in one. If you're a Christian, you have all of them. You display all of them. Gifts are singular, like, or plural, I guess. There's many, but you'll be given one or maybe two or whatever. This, this is how it's going to in, uh, intertwine with what I'm saying today. Each believer has gifts. Let's get into, let's talk about the gifts. The idea of all believers ministering to each other as member, members of the laos of God is integral integral to the New Testament teaching on gifts. For 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 12, verse 4 through 11, teaches that the Holy Spirit has given all of us gifts so that we may minister to the community. The laos. The laos ministers to the laos, right? You see that? The body of Christ and through, the, through this community of believers to the world at large. Hmm. Look at that. We're not just priest to fellow believers, but we're also supposed to be priest to the world at large? You mean like evangelism and discipleship? Hmm. There are three primary New Testament passages that deal with gifts. This is Romans chapter 12, verse 3 through 8, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4 through 30, and Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 through 13. It is evident from these passages that each, each member of the body of Christ has gifts. Like I said, we all have gifts. However, no believer has all the gifts. You don't have all the gifts, but you at least got one, maybe two. This is written in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27 through 30. And we're going to start tying this together. You're going to see it come together. I hope you got your Bible, because this stuff I'm saying, it can't be true. There's no way. Pull out your Bible and so you can prove me wrong. The three primary New Testament passages to deal with gifts are as in Romans, 1 Corinthians, and Ephesians. Another teaching of these passages on the gifts is that they are not primarily for personal edification. Ooh, and I'm not trying to offend anyone. I'm not trying, Paul teaches this just all over the place in the New Testament. Another teaching of these passages on the gifts is that primarily, primarily, they are not for personal edification, uh, for personal, uh, personal use. It's not 
my display of personal gifts or my activation of my personal gifts is not to benefit. Let's call benefit. It's a good word for edification. Benefit is not to benefit me mostly, right? It's to benefit the church. My gifts is to benefit, to edify the church, right? 